Brad, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, warm and sunny Chicago. Uh, I can see why everyone's here. You probably all just guessed at the Hilton and didn't want to didn't go out tonight. I don't blame you. So in terms of learning objectives, we want to evaluate the benefits and the risk of emerging PARP inhibitors in the treatment of BRCA deficient ovarian cancer. In terms of disclosures, I've served as a scientific advisor on advisory boards for AstraZeneca, Morbitech, J&J, and Roche. So I think that uh, when we look at this, you'll notice this is the second time you've seen this slide, and that's because this is really quite a sentinel observation that was made. Um, two Nature papers in 2005 really looking at uh, the, the whole concept of wild-type BRCA homozygous versus homozygous deficient versus heterozygous. And as you can see, the heterozygous, all you need is one copy of BRCA and you're okay. Um, if you lack both, um, the, the cells are easily killed. Um, and that's certainly problematic in terms of survival. So a, a lot of data there, a thousand-fold difference in terms of survival, um, looking at the differences there. So quite impressive in terms of what was seen, and I think um, there were a lot of proof-of-principle concepts that came out of this in terms of looking at BRCA1 versus BRCA2. Um, there, there were certainly the, the fact that you could treat with a PARP inhibitor, um, and that it was highly tumor specific uh, were all concepts that came out of these publications that I think really were the underpinnings of the clinical development programs by a number of pharmaceutical companies. This led into a, a well-publicized phase one uh, uh, that uh, was actually an expansion cohort uh, in which they took 60 patients, 22 of which were carriers for BRCA1 or 2 germline mutations. Pharmacokinetic data indicated rapid absorption and elimination for the drug that was being tested in this, which was an AstraZeneca compound and became Aloparib. The anti-tumor activity uh, was reported only in mutation carriers, all of whom had either ovarian, breast, or prostate cancer and had received previous multiple regimens for, for treatment. The conclusion was that Aloprib had few of the adverse effects of conventional chemotherapy, that it effectively hit target, as there was a translational correlate for the study, and it had anti-tumor activity in cancer associated with b both BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So this is looking, uh, again, at activity and to stress some of what we're, we're talking about tonight, whether we're looking at rhesus or GCIG uh, responses here, you can see that um, patients did respond, uh, whether they were platinum sensitive or resistant. There was a trending, of course, towards those that were platinum sensitive, but it is important to understand that there are those who are platinum resistant who have a mutation who still respond to PARP inhibition. The other thing that's important, uh, it, it, again showing how important this particular paper was, is this is a phase one expansion that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So not a bad uh, uh, resting place for a phase one study. So this is phase two trial of PARP inhibition with Loprib in BRCA deficient advanced ovarian cancer, looking at efficacy. And we've learned several things from the a, a day trial, uh, one of which was that Loprib at 400 milligrams BID is more effective than 100 milligrams BID if you focus on the progression-free survival difference here, you see 5.8 months versus 1.9 months. The other thing is that, uh, importantly, you see responses both in platinum-sensitive and platinum-resistant disease, and I think that's important to understand um, in, at either dose there. And then we started to have a picture of the emergent toxicities that we would see with these compounds as well, and it gives you a pretty good idea, and we see that with increasing the dose to an area uh, that we would be more comfortable with clinically in terms of response. You see that we, we go up by a factor of three or four in terms of discontinuation due to adverse events or to dose interruptions secondary to adverse events as well. If we look at phase two, um, BRCA mutation ovarian cohorts, this is the waterfall plot here. And you can see the third or fourth principle we learned from this particular phase two study was that it didn't matter if you were BRCA1 or BRCA2. The PARP inhibition worked very effectively on both. Uh, 
uh, and that's certainly uh, clearly seen there. So if we look, or we just featured the um, a day study right here, and I just talked about that uh, in terms of the, the breakdown between the two different dose levels, and we can, we can see how heavily pretreated most of these patients are. We're going to look at some other phase two data here. Karen Gelman um, had a, a, a smaller study, but looking at patients treated with Loperib at 400 milligrams BID and had a, up to a 41 percent response rate. And then Rob Coleman presented the GOG data um, at uh, that uh, was uh, um, recently presented at SGO and showed the Veloparib uh, had a response rate of 20 percent. So again, looking at a different PARP in inhibitor in this particular case. So there's a lot of different uh, trials that are out there with different PARP inhibitors. SOLO1 is in frontline therapy, and then we have a number of trials that are in platinum-sensitive disease, and Ursula is going to review these in detail, so I'm not going to go into the schemata or anything here. It gives you an idea of, you know, you have Rucaparib, Niraparib, uh, I mentioned Viliparib, and Aloparib, they're all under uh, uh, development. So let's look at some of the existing data that has shaped our current landscape. Um, this is an important trial that randomized patients uh, uh, that were BRCA1 or 2 germline carriers who had progressive or recurrent disease less than 12 months after previous platinum-based chemotherapy. So fairly prescriptive uh, audience here. Primary objective of this study was to look at the PFS of two dose levels of Aloparib uh, versus pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. So these patients were randomized one to one to one to Aloparib at 200 milligrams BID, uh, given every 28 days, of course, PO, or 400 milligrams uh, BID at 28-day cycles, or PLD at 50 milligrams per meter squared given uh, at every four weeks. And they treated, the, they treated these patients until progression or withdrawal for other reasons. And um, for those patients who were treated in the PLD group, they were allowed to cross over to the Aloper 400 milligram BID group if they had progressive, progression of disease. So this shows the, uh, the differences here um, between the curves. And what's really quite interesting is that the Aloperib actually performed quite well. What happened was the PLD performed much better than would be expected. So the uh, expected PLD performance rate was almost half of what, uh, what occurred. And so you saw a very good uh, uh, progression uh, that, was, that was very close to one another in terms of the progression-free survivals for each of these particular compounds. Um, the 400 milligram per meter squared, again, had uh, the highest response rate. Uh, the last time we went between 400 and 100, the study looked at 400 versus 200. And um, a lot of ways of interpreting this data. Some people see this as a negative trial. I see this as a trial that shows that you could do, um, uh, you could also treat these patients with a PARP inhibitor and do as well as one of the best drugs we have for recurrent ovarian cancer. So I, I think that certainly it's a matter of perspective. If we look at uh, rhesus response, um, the uh, response rate was the highest uh, in the Aloparib 400 milligram per meter squared group with 31 percent response rate with 26% response rate for 200 milligrams, and then PLD had a 19% response rate. So it gives you a little bit of an idea there in terms of what you see with clinical activity. Study 19 uh, was a randomized trial that took patients with platinum-sensitive high-grade serous cancer with greater than or equal to two previous platinum regimens and randomized these patients to Aloparib 400 milligrams BID or placebo. And so these were patients that uh, had a maintained PR or CR and were then randomized. And primary endpoint for this was PFS by rhesus criteria. Secondary endpoints were time to progression um, by CA125. Uh, they also looked at overall survival and safety. So if we look here, you see that uh, clearly the, the, the group that um, received the Aloparib, uh, did uh, tremendously better in terms of median progression-free survival of 8.4 versus 4.8 months. Very impressive hazard ratio 
and highly statistically significant. And this is reported by Jonathan Letterman, first at ASCO in 2011, and then the publication came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. If we look at the adverse events uh, associated with this trial, you can see uh, that the, the most common um, adverse events were nausea, uh, fatigue, um, followed by uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and uh, anemia was uh, down the, down the uh, course. So if we, if we look at the progression-free survival by BRCA mutation status, this data becomes even um, more profound in terms of the differences that you see. So those patients that were treated with Lopra versus, versus um, placebo uh, had a tremendous improvement in progression-free survival uh, with, with uh, hazard ratios that were, were most impressive, uh, one of the most impressive hazard ratios, in fact, I've ever seen of 0 0.18, so very impressive. Overall survival, however, um, was, was uh, not uh, significantly different for the, for the whole group there, as you can see. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, you get into a number of reasons of why that may be, that again, these patients respond to subsequent therapy well. Any DNA damaging drug that's given afterwards is something that they're certainly going to do well with. Time to, subs to second subsequent therapy, so-called PFS2, uh, was certainly improved. Again, um, if you were a BRCA mutant patient who was treated with the Eloparib compared to placebo, you did significantly better. So again, a large amount of uh, phase three development is underway, and this is looking at a, a number of the trials that are out there, and I alluded to some of these, and Ursula is gonna speak to, to most of these as we move forward. Um, this is looking at uh, some of the anti-tumor activity that has been reported for neuroparib, looking at a phase one, two, um, looking at the, the breakout here, and again, seeing both platinum resistant and sensitive patients that respond to these drugs and fairly uh, robust activity that's seen with this PARP inhibitor as well. We have the Kaufman data that uh, really was the formation in terms of the efficacy at least for a lot of approval that we had in December of this past year, in 2014, with an overall uh, response rate of uh, 31%. And uh, again, um, looking at the concept of taking Eloparib and combining it with other agents. This was the big splash at ASCO last year in which we saw the sidirinib and Eloparib data uh, put together. Uh, and uh, quite interesting in terms of looking at these in, in combination versus Eloparib alone. So it was a randomized trial of Eloparib versus sidirinib plus Eloparib. And you can see the combination certainly performed uh, better. If we break it out by BRCA mutation carriers, you see that those that were non-carriers had the biggest benefit from the combination therapy. Those that had a mutation did pretty well on Eloparib alone, quite frankly. And if you factor in the toxicity difference with the combination having higher toxicity, um, it's, it's hard to argue for that combination in those patients. Again, number of trials forthcoming, and we'll get into most of these as we move forward. So I'll leave it at that. And again, um, more trials, more combinations. Uh, so there's a great deal of enthusiasm for carrying these uh, results forward and looking at these different drugs in different settings. So in summary, uh, we certainly see activity for those patients who have BRCA germline mutations. And it also appears to be active in those with BRCA dysfunction from other uh, genes that can be mutated that have a link to homologous repair deficiency. So we know there's at least 13 genes that are out there. You have the, 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 the RAD51, C and D. You have uh, uh, a number of check inhibitors, one and two, as well as some other genes, the ATM, et cetera, that have all been implicated in deficient homologous uh, repair. And these genes have all been shown when present to predict PARP response. And, and so uh, this is an area of active investigation as we move forward. Long-term safety data is still pending, so we have 
great data for short term, but we don't have the long term effects, especially for patients that would be considered to be on maintenance therapy for a prolonged period of time. What would be the long term effects? What if these patients are cured and are alive in five to ten years? Will we see any long term effects? Synthetic lethality is a new paradigm, and PARP inhibitors are being studied in multiple settings, as I, I mentioned, and ongoing trials with, with these and other biologics, I think, will really be quite informative as we move forward in terms of trying to improve the outcome for women with BRCA mutations uh, afflicted with ovarian cancer. Thank you.